Thank you for joining us for this month's Virtual Curators Tour. I'm Jenna Gilley, Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, and I'll be your tour guide today. We will be looking at the exhibition, Peer and Patron, Selections from the Private Collection of Dorothy Gillespie. To begin the tour, I will start with a quote from Gillespie herself. My collection is not a pure one, nor it is a rare or an important collection. I consider it a modest collection of works by wonderful dedicated artists, some of whom I have even known as personal friends. I am proud to share it with you. This modest statement reflects the essence of the artist herself. Dorothy Gillespie was a prolific artist and devout educator who also happened to be a dedicated patron of the arts. From a young age, Gillespie knew that she wanted to be an artist, yet in the pre-war years of the 20th century, most American women could only dream of such colorful careers. Instead, her parents hoped that she would attend nearby Radford University and study to become a school teacher. After a fortuitous family visit by a minister, Gillespie was declared to have a God-given gift for art and was duly enrolled at the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, in Baltimore. Since then, Gillespie strove not only to produce beautiful art, but to be a fierce patron and supporter of female artists everywhere. In 1970, Gillespie co-founded the Women's Inner Art Center in New York City, which provided gallery space and conducted workshops for women artists. She is the organization's inaugural artist in residence. In the midst of curating countless female-focused exhibitions, teaching courses on how to function as a woman in the male-dominated art world, running several women's art organizations, and making her own work, Gillespie was also a happily married wife with three children. Her life is a testimony of all the things a women artist, as she was often called, can achieve with hard work and persistence. Living in New York from the 1940s to the 1980s, Gillespie was also at the heart of America's modern art scene. Many now famous artists on display in this exhibition, Robert Rauschenberg, Helen Frankenthaler, Keith Haring, were, at the time of Gillespie's collecting, unknown in the art world. She simply saw them as her colleagues and friends who produced terrific work. Alternatively, there are also many works in this exhibition by lesser known artists. Her collection can be seen as an agglomeration of her artistic interests and tastes, and of her person. Gillespie's support of female artists is accurately reflected in her collection, of which almost 50% is work produced by female artists. Accompanying each work in the exhibition is also a quote from Gillespie, who comments on her connection to the artist or their piece, making each work personal. However, unlike many of these artists, Gillespie never wanted fame or fortune. Because of this, her work has often gone unrecognized. By displaying Gillespie's work beside these masters of pop and abstract art, this exhibition hopes to rightly establish her as their peer in addition to collector. The first piece we will be looking at more closely today is fittingly a piece made by Dorothy Gillespie herself. Quaver 8 is one of four large works by Gillespie that the museum holds in its permanent collection. It was acquired shortly following Gillespie's citywide exhibition held in Fort Wayne in 1979. This work was a monumental step in cementing the artist's interest in three-dimensional work. A painter by trade, Gillespie wanted her work to come off the wall and interact with viewers in space while retaining a painting's color and thoughtfulness. On coming to our city, Gillespie remarked, I discovered a unique thing in Fort Wayne. The museum here is one of the most active museums I've found. I'm amazed. I had no idea I'd find this kind of art involvement. Note that in Quaver 8, Gillespie has not yet switched to the easier to mold aluminum as her medium of choice, a decision she made to be more in control of her work as a woman working with metal. The complex movement of her pieces, which extend in curling arabesques, caused art critic David Sheary to dub them pictorial semi-quavers, from which Gillespie adopted the name quaver to refer to them. The next piece we'll be studying today is an oil painting by Alice Baber, titled The Three Maypoles of the Jaguar. Post-war feminist artist Alice Baber studied art at Indiana University and at the École des Beaux-Arts in Fontainebleau, France. Her dental abstract imagery favored organic, floating color shapes, as seen in the three maypoles of the jaguar. Using a technique of pouring diluted oil paint onto canvas in layers, 
Faber often referred to her paintings as an attempt to relay feelings through color. Faber's work had a notable influence on Gillespie's compositions. Think back to the last piece shown, and you will note a similar use of vibrant patches of color. The translucency of Babber's work relays the feeling of radiating or refracting light. However, Gillespie's work is usually opaque, which coincided with her choice of paper and later metal as her preferred materials. On the artist, Gillespie notes, a very best friend who had a great influence on me. I still miss her. She was beautiful like her paintings. The third piece we'll be looking at today is Golf Plus Western Plaza by Ida Applebrook. On this work, Gillespie notes, in the early 1970s, Francine de Saint Armand, director of the gallery at the Women's Inner Art Center, installed an exhibition on the work of Ida Applebrook, and I saw it every day for over a month. In the late 1980s, I bid on this piece at an auction and got it. Born in the Bronx, Applebrook studied at the New York State Institute of Applied Arts and Sciences and later at the Art Institute of Chicago. She moved to the West Coast in the late 1960s and briefly taught at the University of California at San Diego, returning to New York in the mid-1970s. As Applebrook's career developed, she worked as a painter, sculptor, maker of artist books, performance and video artist. Her paintings eventually developed from foremost abstraction toward social commentary. Apple Brooks prints, like her paintings, are known for their cartoon-like style and their psychologically potent, though often ambiguous, multi-paneled imagery surrounding gender politics and power. Here in Gulf Plus Western Plaza, we see an androgynous figure answering two telephones. To the right of the large figure, three repeated images of a female bodybuilder are stacked fading in contrast as they ascend. Perhaps this image is commenting on the unrealized dreams of the central figure, or on standard gender roles, as an arguably male figure is put in a secretary position while a female's muscular body is serialized and celebrated. Either way, the work encourages us to empathize with its subject and attempt to understand the artist's selected imagery. Changing pace slightly, the next work comes from one of Gillespie's favorite artists, Jean Dubuffet. Le Gomo, Carte 22, the dandy, Carte 22, comes from Dubuffet's celebrated 1967 Banque de Loup series. This series, begun in 1962, would preoccupy the artist for many decades, and began as a doodle created on the telephone. Each drawing corresponds to a specific playing card, making a deck of 52 cards in total. The artist believed this style evoked the manner in which objects appear in the mind. The title, Lore Loop, cannot be directly translated. Dubuffet associated it to the French verbs ourler, to roar, oululer, to hoot, and the noun loop, wolf. All fitting for a card game. According to Gillespie, she enjoyed the piece because the imagery is quite beautiful. I have to decide what to do about the fold that shows across the background. It can be restored perfectly if I feel it's necessary. The fold makes me wonder what happened. Obviously, she never got it restored, but that adds to the character and provenance of the piece. For those who may be familiar with contemporary art, this work may look familiar. Gillespie didn't know what to make of Keith Haring's untitled 1-6, One, One Plate, 1982, when she first purchased the piece. Price was the determining factor in purchasing this black and white print, she says, but after living with it for a short time, I realized that it's good art, an education for me. Soon after this purchase, however, Herring would become one of the top artists of the 1980s and 90s. Although the artist studied at the School of Visual Arts, he was often associated with the self-taught graffiti artist who marked up New York City's subways. While making designs in empty advertising boards and other spaces, Herring developed an easily understood set of cartoon-like symbols that are recognizably his. In doing so, he attempted to create signs through which he, as a trained artist, could communicate his ideas with the mass public. In this early piece, several of Herring's most iconic imagery is featured, including the barking dog, dancing figure, and cross, one iteration of Herring's often subversion of religious iconography. Gillespie notes that after living with this piece for a few months, she grew to appreciate it so much that she wanted a more important piece, leading her to purchase Herring's Silence Equals Death, 
a commentary on the Nazi persecution of gay people during World War II. The prints were sold to raise money for victims of AIDS, which Herring himself would pass away from in 1990. Thank you for joining me on this virtual curator's tour. If you would like to see more beautiful pieces of art from many modern masters, I encourage you to come see Peer and Patron, selections from the private collection of Dorothy Gillespie before the show closes on November 13th. While you're here, you can also see many of Gillespie's large outdoor sculptures located in our sculpture court in a year-long exhibition titled Garden Party, Outdoor Sculptures by Dorothy Gillespie.